today is a very important topic called young stroke and uh, it's a, a very uh, big topic and covering this entire uh, thing in uh, one hour is going to be difficult so what i'll do is i'll just give a brief overview of the subject and with special reference to young stroke and the rest of the things people who are interested can read and this uh, presentation is primarily to uh, facilitate reading so that you can learn and read i'll just initiate the learning process and the rest can be followed up uh, so i'll just give a overview of how do we approach a patient with young stroke because as we all know a young stroke is very common and it is uh, seen that almost uh, 15% of the stroke which occurs are mainly in the young so it's getting more and more common and especially in our region that is the um, the asia pacific region uh, the young stroke is quite uh, more prevalent the cause being not known and uh, so we need to know this uh, uh, entity properly and the approach to young stroke is bit different from that of the routine strokes so i'll start with a very brief case which i uh, saw almost 2 years back so this is a 9 year old boy he is from asansol which is a nearby uh, city um, it's a nearby city to durgapur it's a 5 days history of sudden onset of weakness of the left upper limb and lower limb with facial deviation to the right so this was the history which which uh, he presented there was no past history of migraine no history of headache trauma or any other systemic symptoms or features of any systemic infection the family history was normal on examination head to foot examination was normal there was no uh, any stigmata of any uh, systemic disorder and uh, uh, the cranial nerve examination fundus was normal no evidence of any vasculitis and uh, there was a left mild umn facial paralysis and grade 3 power in the left upper limb grade 4 power in the left lower limb with mildly brisk reflexes and upgoing plantar on the left side so he had a classical left hemiparesis a very young boy 9 year old with no other systemic illness and uh, no significant past history and rest of the examination the pulse was normal there was no atrial fibrillation or any cardiac uh, pathologies in auscultation of the heart so this is the mri scan and uh, as we all know this is the t2 weighted image you can see the csf is white so this is a t2 weighted image and gray matter is uh, dark and white matter is yeah the white matter is dark and the gray matter is gray you can see here so there is a large uh, hyper intensity involving the caudate nucleus the basal ganglia this is the basal ganglia cord uh, this is the caudate this is the basal ganglia which in concludes of the putamen and the globus pallidum and then you are having this this is the external capsule so there is a large lesion hyper intensity involving the right side Uh, of the um, basal ganglia and the surrounding areas and if you can see here the blood vessels are quite prominently seen in the left side but here it is less so probably the there is a occlusion of the middle cerebral artery involving the right side and it is not a complete stem occlusion because it if it's a complete stem occlusion the infarct would have been larger involving the whole of the mca tertiary but it's not involving the whole of the mc tertiary so it's probably a deeper branch involvement probably m2 uh, m2 or m3 involvement but the size of the impact is large there is some mass effect is also seen so this was the initial presentation so young stroke i had to evaluate the patient this is the hemoglobin this is the esr and this is the crp everything is normal there is no inflammation renal functions liver function tests are normal peripheral smear was done which did not show any abnormal cells sickling test was done because the, the, there are few cases of sickle cell anemia which is uh, seen in this region and we did a 2d echo which was normal and ecg was also normal the echo was repeated by an experienced cardiologist and no cardiac abnormality was uh, found the thrombophilia testing we planned for the protein c protein s and the entire thrombophilia pat, uh, profile but because the patient was uh, from a very poor background so we could not uh, do the thrombophilia testing here now because uh, he is uh, he had a very uh, young stroke so i wanted to evaluate the vasculature so a dsa was done so this was sent to a higher center because they could not afford uh, this dsa in a private setup so 
we had sent the patient to the apex institute in calcutta and uh, this the dsa was done in the government setup and you can see there is a occlusion involving the this is the ica internal cerebral artery this is the mca and this is the anterior communicating artery and this is the aca so you can see there is good flow here you can see lot of collaterals here and the other branches are beautifully seen but in the right ica you can see there is a uh, complete occlusion of the right ica and the M, uh, mca branches are not seen and there is uh, no collaterals as well so there is a occlusion involving the right ca this is the posterior circulation and you can see this is uh, the vertebral artery this is the basilar artery and this is the pca and this you can see the posterior communicating artery so all are well seen so there is a stroke involving the middle cerebral artery and there is a uh, vascular occlusion here so and you can see the arch is quite okay there is no occlusion in the arch so this was uh, uh, the radiologist uh, there uh, and the neurologist this was reported by them and uh, i discussed the case with them so they had written it like a unilateral moya moya disease or it was a focal angiopathy of some uh, type which was affecting the blood vessel a neurosurgery opinion was also done and they felt that it was unlikely to be a moya moya disease because the entire uh, ica is getting occluded usually in moya moya what happens is the distal branches that is the mca and the circle of willis gets affected and there are a lot of collaterals all about and there is a puff of smoke appearance which was not seen so a neurosurgeon uh, and everyone felt that it's unlikely to be moya moya and it's probably some sort of a focal angiopathy which has occurred and so uh, we went forward with conservative management only no intervention was done and the child was started on aspirin and uh, he came for follow up twice or thrice and after that he lost to follow up for last one year and uh, with a diagnosis of focal cerebral angiopathy and aspirin was continued he, there was improvement in the motor power gradually and he was able to walk uh, without support some distal uh, spasticity and some distal weakness was there apart from that he was quite well so this is uh, a, a prototype case in the pediatric age group of a pediatric stroke which we can uh, which we often come across in our clinical practice now here if it was a moya moya disease which can again present with uh, similar manifestation then usually the neurosurgical uh, interventions are required and vascular intervention is required for the management but in this case we went for conservative management so this is just a small uh, example of the cases uh, which we may come across in the younger age group and then it becomes difficult because a pediatric child or a pediatric age group uh, when somebody comes with a focal neurological deficit then thinking of a stroke is the last possible uh, diagnosis which you would like to consider because pediatric strokes are not very common so you have to keep into mind that even strokes can occur in the very young age group as well now we all know the stroke in the young is divided as brain ischemia and brain hemorrhage as in the elderly age group and so ischemia can be due to thrombosis can be due to embolism from other site embolism can be of two type one is a artery to artery embolism and second is a cardioembolic uh, disease and then systemic hypoperfusion so if there is a hypotension and if the collateral flow is not very good then there can be watershed infarcts uh, especially in hypoperfusion so this watershed infarcts can occur in the major blood vessels like the aca mca watershed zone or the mca pca watershed zone or it can occur in the deep penetrating artery watershed zones also so there are two watershed zones which can uh, the infarction can occur so that we have to get the history of a hypotension or a low blood pressure which may have give rise to the watershed infarct then brain hemorrhages we all know intracerebral hemorrhage or subarachnoid hemorrhage so in this uh, uh, session like we'll not be going into details of the intracerebral hemorrhage so mainly of the ischemic stroke and some bit of uh, intracranial hemorrhages will also be discussed now brain ischemia i have already mentioned thrombosis can occur so thrombosis refers to local in situ obstruction of an artery so the obstruction is can be due to the disease of the arterial wall like arteriosclerosis or some uh, atheromatous plaque which ruptures and there's unstable plaque which ruptures and gives rise to occlusion like in the myocardial infarction or it can be due to dissection of the arteries or some conditions like fibromuscular dysplasia etc which can give rise to thrombosis 
or some vasculitis, which is giving rise to inflammation of the blood vessel and thrombosis. So any etiology, be it atherosclerosis, vasculopathy, vasculitis, everything can give rise to in situ thrombosis and a stroke. Now embolism. Embolism is uh, originating from somewhere else and then it gets embolized to involve the blood vessel. So the process is not local in embolic. And hypoperfusion I've already mentioned. Now, this is a very busy slide. I'll not go into the entire details. Now, this is the pathophysiological classification of uh, uh, pathophysiological classification of stroke. So you can see uh, the stroke can be divided into large artery, uh, athero uh, large vessel atherosthrombotic stroke, which I've already mentioned. These are the sites of the atherosclerosis. Usually it's in the bifurcation of the common carotid artery or the carotid siphon. And the less common sites are also mentioned here. Then comes the small vessel lacuna stroke. And the mechanism here is different. It is lipohyalinosis, not atherosclerosis. And uh, sometimes the atherothrombosis may also be there. And most common location is in the penetrating branches. So it occurs in deeper areas and the size of the infarcts are uh, smaller in size. So that constitutes the lacuna stroke. And then you are having a huge group of uh, cardio-iotic embolic disease. So either the embolism can be from the heart or it can come from the arch of the iota. Now, arch of the iota, if there is a more than four millimeter um, uh, plaque involving the arch of the iota, then that can give rise to an atherothrombosis. So it's a very important site of um, atherothrombotic stroke. We must remember that we look for everything. We look for the heart. We look for uh, all the things, but we often miss the arch of the iota. So you have to do a <clears throat> proper angiogram right from the arch to the vertex. So it's called as the arch to the vertex angiogram, CT angiogram or DSA. And the arch of the aorta should also be evaluated, especially when you see that the carotids are normal and the, uh, the in internal carotid artery, the other distal vessels are normal and the heart is also normal. And when you are not getting a focus of emboli, then always look for the arch of the aorta because there may be plaques there which may be missed in a normal Doppler or some other investigation. So these are the various uh, causes and uh, I'll just brief the, in the heart disease, we should know that some lesions are more prone for uh, cerebral embolism while some are less prone for embolism. So yeah, what are the lesions which are more prone for embolism? Most important is atrial fibrillation. We all know that. So any stroke patient, young patient or older patient, First thing is we have to rule out a atrial fibrillation. Now the AF can be a uh, persistent AF or a chronic AF or it may be a paroxysmal AF. Paroxysmal means transient AF. So in that case, we need to do a prolonged whole term monitoring to get a paroxysmal AF. Then there may be other abnormalities like left atrial thrombus, left ventricular thrombus, sick sinus syndrome, AF, and a myocardial infarction within the past one month. Mitral stenosis is very common in our part of the world mechanical heart, heart valves and a MI with a low ejection fraction less than 28% or a DCM with a low ejection fraction of less than 40%. So these values you should remember less than 28 in chronic MI or DCM with less than 40% and non-bacterial endocarditis, infective endocarditis. So these are the commoner lesions which can give rise to AF. So if you find this lesion, there is a high chance that the, uh, the stroke is cardioembolic then less uh, chances of uh, stroke can occur with mitral annular calcification, PFOs, atrial septal aneurysm, and atrial septal aneurysm with uh, PFO. So these things, wall motion abnormalities like hypokinesia, echinacea, other than epical echinacea. Now, epical echinacea uh, gives rise uh, to more chances of embolism, while other wall echinacea are low-risk lesions, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So if you get this in the eco scan, then you know that it is likely to be a low risk lesion. While if other lesions are there, then you think that it's a high risk lesion. So this has to be uh, known. And then the aortic source of embolism. So if there is a complex atheroma in the ascending aorta or the proximal arch, more than four millimeters thickness, or if there is mobile debris or plaque ulceration. So if you get any one of this, then you should know that this the aorta may be a major source of embolism. Okay, so we'll just go to the uh, toast classification. So this is the basic classification of stroke. It's known as the toast classification. 
So it classifies the subtypes of the acute ischemic stroke. As I've already mentioned, large artery atherosclerosis. Second is cardioembolism from the heart. Then small vessel occlusions. Then there are types like stroke of undetermined etiology. You evaluate the patient. You do everything. You do the angiogram. You have done the echo. You have done the ECG. Everything is normal. So it's said as stroke of undetermined etiology. Uh, and there is one group where there is stroke of other determined etiology, like some other disorder, like hematological disorder or some vasculitis or some TB meningitis or some herpes vasculopathy, so which is giving rise to stroke. So that is stroke of other determined etiology. And undetermined means despite of uh, uh, all the evaluation, evaluation is negative or you are getting two or more causes of the stroke. So multiple causes identified, you don't know which is giving rise to the stroke or if the evaluation is not perfectly complete. So you are not able to do a, a CT angiogram. You have just, just done a, a Doppler. You are not able to do a transesophageal echo. You have just done a, a transthoracic echo. So in that case, the evaluation is incomplete. So in that case, again, you have to say it's a stroke of undetermined etiology. So this is the broad classification of the stroke. Now, this is a very complex slide and I will not go into the uh, details of this. It's not required at a basic level, but a uh, few things I'd like to just highlight. So whenever you get a large artery atherosclerosis, you should look at uh, the occlusion uh, of the blood vessels, the major blood vessels. So if it is uh, uh, more than 50%, at least there should be a occlusion. Then only you can say it's a significant or if it is less than 50%, there should be some plaque ulceration or thrombus, which is seen in that. And uh, there should be history of a Amaroxus fibax, so that is called as TMB, transient monocular blindness, or stroke in the area of the atherothrombosis, previous stroke. So if you get this pattern, then you can correlate that the likely the atherothrombosis is giving rise to the stroke. Second is a cardiac aortic disease. Now, cardiac aortic disease, there should be evidence of a high-risk cardiac source of cerebral embolism, which I've already mentioned, either MS, either AF, or either a left atrial thrombus, a low ejection fraction less than 28% in a MI or less than 40% in, um, in a dilated cardiomyopathy. So if infective endocarditis, so all these things, it's a high risk lesion. So if you get a high risk lesion, that is okay. And if there is evidence of other systemic embolism, suppose if there is a patient has an emboli involving the distal hands or the feet and there is a dry gangrene which is getting up. So then you can say it's a cardioembolic stroke. And there should be multiple infarctions in uh, involving multiple territories. So it should be right, left, anterior, posterior circulation. So multiple circulations are getting affected and there should not be evidence of any major blood vessel occlusion. So then only you can say it's a cardioiotic embolism. Now coming to small vessel occlusion, they have given uh, the size of the lesion. So the size of the lesion should be less than 20 millimeters. And it should be there in the perforating artery territory. So in the basal ganglia or in the brain stem, such areas, the infarct should be there and it should be smaller in size. And there should be no major occlusions in the blood vessels and there should be no evident cardiac sources of the embolus. Then you can say it's a small artery occlusion. So these are the various criteria we should know whenever uh, we get a patient with stroke. And in young stroke, it becomes very pertinent that rather than just writing a ischemic stroke or a hemorrhagic stroke, you should always try to uh, write about the mechanism of the stroke. So whenever you write the diagnosis, the third point is what is the type of stroke? First, what is the territory involved? Third is what is the mechanism of the stroke? Whether it's a large artery atherothrombosis, whether it's a cardioembolism or cardioartic embolism, whether it's a small vessel occlusion, or whether it's an undetermined cause, or there is some other specific cause like vasculitis or something like that. So always try to write the mechanism of the stroke. So this is called as the mechanism of stroke. And the mechanism of the stroke, you can make out by looking at the, uh, the pattern of the infarct, the territory which is involved, what is the pattern of the infarct. And you, you have to look at the blood vessels, the vasculature from the arse to the vertex, and also the heart, and also systemic features wherever it is required systemic evaluation, hematological evaluation, vasculitic evaluation. So putting all together, you can know about the uh, mechanism, uh, what is giving rise to the stroke. Okay, so there is a, a term which has to be introduced and I think everybody should know this. Uh, it's called as a
sorry about that some problem happened so is this slide visible yeah visible visible okay okay so it's called as a embolic source of undetermined significance or issues so it's uh, quite coming up and with the advancement in the investigations the issues are the uh, cryptogenic stroke if you can say it so it may probably a type of cryptogenic stroke so issues they have uh, like there is some criteria which can tell us like it is an embolic stroke but we are not able to find out the origin of the embolus so in this scan ct or the mri scan it should not be a lacuna stroke so stroke size, size should be larger so they have given a dimension of 1.5 cm in the uh, ct scan or 2 cm in mri so it should be larger than that and there should be no not more than 50% luminal stenosis of the major arteries and there should be no cardiac uh, high risk lesions and no other specific causes like vasculitis dissection migraine vasospasm <coughs> or drug abuse so if you exclude all this and if you are having a large infarct in the mri which is more than this size of 2.2 cm in mri and 1.5 cm in ct in a distribution which is not in the uh, lacuna uh, territory then you can say it is likely to be a issues so this terminology also has to be uh, 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 remembered now what are the stroke mimics now stroke mimics means the conditions which can mimic like a stroke so in the young age even the stroke mimics are more common than in the elderly age group so the most common stroke mimic which we see is a migraine with aura so sometimes a migraine can have sensory symptoms in one part of the hand feet and the face so it may look like a um, look like a stroke and it is usually followed by headache and other symptoms there may be past history of headache so if we take a proper history we can definitely find out whether it's a migraine with a aura sometimes the migraine can have complications like a stroke so a stroke may occur in a patient with migraine with aura so that also has to be kept into mind then tod spalsy suppose there is a structural lesion in the brain on one side and the patient develops multiple uh, multiple episodes of uh, focal seizures so if there is multiple episodes of focal seizures suppose right focal seizures many times then what happens is after the seizures the part of the brain where the uh, seizures occurred there is a edema formation and because of that edema the patient will go into a paralysis like thing so it's called as a tod spalsy and gradually when the edema subsides the paralysis improves so the tod spalsy may also look like a stroke so you may ask the history of similar attacks in the past whether the patient has uh, a scan before you can look for the whether there is a fixed lesion there some scar is there some old history of trauma old stroke all this can give rise to a tod spalsy so that you have to look for sometimes a tumor intracranial space occupying lesion can uh, look like a stroke cvt is a type of venous stroke which can again present with uh, hemiplegia uh, headache papilledema and seizures functional deficit very important young patient female patient young patient with depression and other things may suddenly exactly mimic like a stroke so then you have to evaluate the patient take the history find out there is a stressor before the uh, stroke like episode ask the history whether there is a, a stress or something uh, which uh, was there before uh, the onset of the symptoms and also in the functional patient you can see that usually the face is paired and they will give a fluctuating weakness so when you try to ask them to hold so they'll give some give away weakness so initially you will feel that the power is there and then they will suddenly let go so that's called as a give away weakness so with that and then plantas you can examine the reflexes may not be uh, asymmetrically increased uh, but it may be quite difficult sometimes to see uh, to find out whether it's functional or not so then it's better to investigate and do the scans of the brain to rule out um, a actual stroke before we say it's a functional uh, disease then head trauma then mitochondrial diseases these are quite rare subdural hematoma definitely you should not miss especially in elderly patient Uh, subdural hematoma can present with acute uh, neurological deficit and it's very important to know because if the patient uh, presents with uh, symptoms you may uh, thrombolysis is contraindicated if there is a subdural hematoma and sometimes the hematoma may be iso intense in the ct scan so it may be missed and some hematomas may similar look like the brain parenchyma itself and so it may be easily missed also so you have you should have a high index of suspicion uh, to rule out a sub subdural hematoma before you are going to thrombolyze the patient 
so these are the uh, major things and one thing one more thing is hypoglycemia so any any patient uh, with uh, hemiplegia you should rule out a hypoglycemia especially diabetic patients on insulin and all now what is coming to the topic proper what is the definition of young so i went through many papers and uh, publications but none of them uh, um, defined what is the definition of a young stroke so usual age what i could find is 15 to 45 years maybe up to 50 years some patient mentioned so above 45 years you can say it's a young stroke and lower limit is 15 below 15 is a pediatric age group stroke and this i have already mentioned it can be ischemic it can be hemorrhagic and venous stroke is also common in the younger age group and etiology pediatric young women and pregnancy so these are the special groups which can occur especially in the pregnancy the strokes uh, postpartum and the intrapartum period this many different types of strokes and different etiology may occur which we should be well versed with now why is it important to know about uh, young stroke we should know that the current epidemiological data suggests that one out of six strokes are in the young adults and up to 15% of the cerebral infarcts are occurring in the young so it's a very common disorder and it has a etiologic diagnosis which requires a different and more complex diagnostic workup so unlike a elderly patient who comes with stroke and you know is a diabetic hypertensive and he has all the risk factors you need not do a very extensive workup but when you get a young stroke you are worried because you do not know what is the underlying disease which is giving rise to the stroke so the workups workup becomes quite intense and very taxing and you got to do all sort of investigations to try to find out what may be the underlying etiology and the management may be different because the underlying cause may be different so if you are getting a vasculitis you have to manage with immunosuppressant if you are getting a tuberculous meningitis you have to manage with att so the treatment is entirely different depending upon the cause of the stroke if you are having a moya moya you have to revascularize uh, the patient by doing a intervention so there is a huge difference in the management of the classical stroke and a young stroke patient with a different diagnosis now you should know that this young people 15 to 45 are the most productive age group of the society and this stroke may have a huge economic back, uh, impact not only on the family but also in the entire nation but the good thing is that the prognosis is good and the recovery is also good because these people are young comorbidities are less and the neuroplasticity is also very good so these patients recover quite well and it may be a forerunner or initial manifestation of catastrophic disease so very severe disorders can present with a stroke like presentation so it becomes of paramount importance that we try to diagnose the condition to predict the prognosis as well as to make out the right treatment path now etiology on the young stroke can be ischemic which i have already mentioned ischemic stroke large artery stroke may be there there can be premature atherosclerosis dissections can occur especially it can be traumatic and non traumatic as well inherited metabolic diseases can occur vascular uh, collagen vascular diseases like fibromuscular dysplasia may affect the blood vessel wall vasculitis can affect moya moya disease can occur radiation induced vasculopathy can occur and then drug induced especially in the young age group you should always ask history of addictions especially cocaine and the various heroin and various uh, drugs which the youngsters take they may all give rise to stroke both ischemic and hemorrhagic strokes are well known so always ask history of addictions iv drug abuse in the patient with young stroke small vessel diseases vasculopathy cardioembolic disease which i have already mentioned rheumatic heart disease congenital heart disease arrhythmias endocarditis mvp pfo atrial myxomas and cardiac surgeries and procedures you should know and hematological diseases are a very important group which can give rise to stroke especially in some areas sickle cell disease may be there leukemias can present with stroke hypercoagulable states so there are lot of uh, hypercoagulable diseases protein c protein s antithrombin 3 apls syndrome factor 5 lead in deficiency so this can all give rise to young stroke dic thrombocytosis polycythemia is a important cause of uh, young stroke and ttp thrombotic uh, thrombocytopenic purpura and then venous occlusions can occur in the hematological diseases which can give rise to stroke and finally migraine is also a uh, uncommon but important cause of young stroke now hemorrhagic stroke i'll not be going into the detail of this subarachnoid hemorrhage we know cerebral aneurysm so aneurysm rupture is a important cause 
and intraparenchymal hemorrhage. So in the elderly patient, what we see intraparenchymal hemorrhage is usually due to two major causes. One is a hypertension and second is a amyloid angiopathy. But in the younger age group, it can be due to AV malformations. It can be due to neoplasms, which can give rise to bleed. Hematological disorders like sickle cell, etc. can give rise to bleed. Moya Moya disease, we all know in the initial stages, it will give rise to uh, infarction and later on it gives rise to bleed. So that is a thing. And then drug induced, all the antiplatelet drugs, many of the patients are on dual antiplatelets. Then warfarin, the newer Novax, newer uh, oral anticoagulants, all this can give rise to bleeds and periprocedural bleed. You should know that the amphetamines and phenylpropylamine, nasal decongestants, etc., can also give rise to bleed. So this is the what I could find out from the Indian uh, epidemiological studies, common diseases which can give rise to young stroke in our nation is like cardiomyopathy, rheumatic heart disease, prosthetic heart disease, atrial fibrillation, bacterial endocarditis. Less common is MI and the related disorders. And infections are quite common, especially tuberculous meningitis is notorious to cause strokes. APLS syndrome is quite uh, a common cause of stroke. And less common are the other vasculitis. And then atherosclerosis is a common cause because we know that with the obesity and the uh, poor food habits and uh, sedentary lifestyle, lack of exercise and all those things, even atherosclerosis can occur in the young age group. Resection is a common cause and various rare causes are also there, which I'll not go into the details. Now, intracerebral hemorrhage, I'll just touch upon it. So, intracerebral hemorrhage, uh, almost 14.2% occur in the younger age group. And these are the commonest causes which have been seen, ruptured aneurysm, ruptured AVM, hypertension in the young age group, eclampsia, especially in the pregnancy and the age groups. So, these are the common causes. Now, if you look at the risk factors uh, of ischemic stroke in young patients, 18 years to 55 years, if you look at that, this chart, this will show you that the most common risk factor for ischemic stroke is tobacco smoking. So smoking is the killer in young uh, patients and it is most of the strokes are associated with tobacco smoking. So stopping smoking is the very important in intervention which, can, uh, which should be started at a young age. Physical inactivity is the second most commonest cause. Hypertension in the young, dyslipidemia, obesity, diabetes. These are the other common cause, which is again seen in the elderly age group. So the, the common risk factors uh, in the young group, young age group and the older age group may be similar in a certain group. Only tobacco smoking is the thing which is more commoner, uh, commonly seen in the younger age group. And physical inactivity, again, surprisingly, it's also common in the younger age group. Then the heart diseases are there like uh, coronary artery disease, congestive heart failure, myocardial infarction. This may, atrial fibrillation may also be seen in the younger age group. Other less doc documented but modifiable causes are one is alcohol consumption. So alcohol intake is again associated with stroke. Migraine, you can see almost a lifetime 27% uh, of the other causes, migraine may be important cause. So always ask the history of migraine. Now, low sleep, less time, less than six hours. So, poor sleep may be a risk factor for stroke. And a very important cause, again, is obstructive sleep apnea. We all know obstructive sleep apnea can give rise to excessive daytime somnolence. There is a high risk of uh, nocturnal hypertension during obstru obstructive sleep apnea, which can give rise to strokes. There is a increased chances of uh, poor diabetic control in obstructive sleep apnea patients. And also it can give rise to various other manifestations like depression, anxiety, memory loss. So obstructive sleep apnea also you should screen in young patients who are having a stroke. Now, uh, we, this I've already mentioned, it is important in developing countries like India because it has a very important economic burden and uh, enormous consequences to the family and the nation. And uh, we have seen that less uh, the average age of stroke in uh, our country, in developing country, is 15 years less than the developed countries. So it is quite common to have a young stroke in our region compared to the developed uh, countries. So these are the various studies which has been uh, done in India, epidemiological studies. And you can see there are studies from Vellore and uh, all the parts of India, South India, and then Kashmir, Mumbai, Kerala. So most of these studies show that the prevalence is around, you can see 10%, some studies say 25%. Even Jipmer, which is in South India, 
36% and uh, 18%, 10 to 15. So average, you can see it's around ranges from around 10 to 30, 35%. So average, you can take around 15 to 20% of uh, strokes occur in the younger age group. So these are the various differential diagnoses, cardiac disease. I'll just summarize again. So cardiac disease, large vessel atherosclerosis, uh, vessel disease, which can be due to atherosclerosis, most important. Then dissections, which can be due to some inherited vascular problems like fibromuscular dis dysplasias or inherited metabolic diseases affecting the muscle wall. It can be due to infections, especially tuberculosis and syphilis. And syphilis is not very common in our place. Tuberculosis and herpes is another cause of vascul vasculopathy. Then vasculitis, various primary vasculitis or secondary vasculitis like SLE, rheumatoid, Sjogren's, all these things can affect the blood vessels. Moema disease, radiation and illicit drug use. So these are the large vessel involvement. Now small vessel can be again due to infections, non-infections, etc. And diseases like Febris disease, which can give rise to small vessel vasculitis. Hematological disorders are a huge group of diseases. So we should keep this into mind, various uh, diseases and finally migraine. So this is the broad classification or differential diagnosis of a young ischemic uh, stroke. Now history uh, taking in a young stroke is similar to that in the uh, classical uh, elderly stroke. So you ask the onset of the deficit. So most important thing is when was the patient last seen normal? So that is the most important thing that will give you a clue because you know that the acute treatment of stroke is time bound. We have a, a window period of four and a half hours for IV thrombolysis and up to six hours and sometimes it may go up to uh, 12 to 24 hours also for the mechanical uh, thrombectomy and the various uh, uh, reperfusion uh, proce procedures which are now uh, quite uh, useful and has been found to be quite effective. So the onset of symptom is most important and you should always try to find that out. Many a time the patient may be sleeping when the stroke occurs. So then it becomes quite difficult and then you have to take the uh, when the patient was last seen normal as the onset of the symptoms. And this is called as a wake up stroke. So whenever you get a wake up stroke, it becomes quite difficult because you do not know what is the onset. So in that case, you have to do additional investigations. You may have to do the MRI scan and there are a uh, few techniques like the flare diffusion mismatch, which you have to see. And also the CT perfusion or the MR perfusion imaging, which may help you to find out whether the patient is a good candidate for a mechanical thrombectomy. Because if you see that the tissue is uh, salvageable and there is a large penumbra which can be salvaged by doing the intervention, then irrespective of the timing, you go with the intervention. So now the concept of time is brain, which we thought before, like we should have time fixed management has changed. Now we are looking at the tissue based management. So how the tissue is, so time may not be very, very important because the collateral supply and circulation of the patients may vary from each other. So some patient with a good collateral may tolerate the stroke for longer period of time and they may be having a large salvageable tissue even after 10 hours of the stroke. So in this patient, you can go for thrombectomy or the mechanical uh, treatment, mechanical thrombectomy, even if uh, the patient comes delayed into the uh, window period. So the concept is from a time window, we are going for a tissue window for the management of stroke. Now you have to look for the associated symptoms like headache, vomiting, seizures, neck pain, rule out mimics like Tort's palsy, migraine, conversion disorder, and hypoglycemia. So these are the main mimics. Now there are, there are a few studies which have looked at what will happen if you thrombolyze a mimic. So they have seen that it doesn't give rise to much higher risk of uh, uh, risk of hemorrhage. So even if you are not very sure that it is a real stroke or a mimic, and you do not have the resource to do MRI very urgently or very quickly, then you can, even then you can thrombolyze the patient. So that is what the uh, study says. Now the past history, you have to look for cardiac illness. You have to ask for migraine. You look for the systemic features of vasculitis like fever, joint pain, photosensitivity, skin ulcers, testicular pain for polyarthritis nodosa, limb claudications, upper limb for tachyosis disease, abdominal pain for mesenteric ischemia, which can seen in polyarthritis nodosa. You look for oral ulcers, genital ulcers, red eye, which is seen in vessus disease. You look for hematuria, which can occur in various types of vasculitis and also for the sicker symptoms for Sjogren's. 
ask the history of manipulation or trauma in the neck very important many patients may have some trivial fall or they may be going to a uh, to a beauty parlor or a barber shop in which the neck may be manipulated uh, for a massage or some chiropractic maneuvers they may have tried for some neck pain and this can all give rise to dissection of the carotid and the vertebral arteries so that has to be taken uh, asked about you ask the history of herpes which may give rise to vasculitis and you ask history of anemia with sickle crisis or pains etc visual problems sensory symptoms in the limbs and also snake bite because viper bite can give rise to uh, the various uh, strokes bleeds and infarcts both may occur so that we have to take history of that and in the female patients recurrent abortion very important to rule out apls syndrome so at, at least you should have a one mid trimester abortion or there should be three uh, first trimester abortions to say that it's a significant abortion you ask history of other dvts also other uh, venous thrombosis or myocardial infarction or other evidence of any uh, venous occlusions in the past to rule out apls syndrome Uh, syphilis is not very common in our part and so genital lesions you should ask and also generalized skin rash which occurs in the secondary syphilis tuberculosis definitely you should ask of and uh, evening rise of temperature weight loss headache cranial nerve palsy all those things you look for abortion dvt and pregnancy again i have mentioned hiv is a uh, important cause of vasculopathy so ask history of uh, exposure especially in the young patient other vasculitis bronchial asthma chronic infections otitis media eosinophilia for chuck stross syndrome hbsag hcv positivity in the past for polyarteritis nodosa or essential mixed cryoglobinemia bleeding disorders also coagul uh, collagen vascular diseases ask for shoulder dislocation bowel rupture and spontaneous pneumothorax so this is this can be seen in conditions like marfan syndrome or heller danlos syndrome which can be associated with uh, brain hemorrhages and various type of strokes drug history very very important especially in young patient ask history of cocaine amphetamines iv drug use that may be related to hiv infective endocarditis may occur in iv drug abuse patients ask history of smoking and alcohol interferons which is used in multiple sclerosis and various uh, viral infections chronic hepatitis etc can give rise to strokes phenylephrine ergots and bromocriptin can give rise to stroke antiplatelets anticoagulants and oral contraceptive pills very very important because ocp is associated with cerebral venous thrombosis and also it can if ocp is used in migraine patients then there may be a risk of higher risk of stroke so ocp use this history has to be taken especially in the young uh, females family history ask about stroke cardiac illness migraine mitochondrial disorders early diabetes short stature and retinitis and uh, hypertension and diabetes etc in the family okay so you have done with the history and now you go for the head to the foot examination so few findings which may be helpful like uh, xanthelasmas corneal arcus which will tell you that the patient has a uh, dyslipidemia or may be prone for premature atherosclerosis vasculitis in the eye may tell you that it may be a systemic vasculitis this is angioid streak which may be seen with a uh, pseudo xanthoma elasticum or ella danlos syndrome which may again tell that there is a collagen vascular disease lens dislocation in homocystinemias then you may have various sort of vasculitic pictures this is a hypopion uveitis in bashets papilledema uh, uh, sorry this is a non arteritic aion so this is a non arteritic aion which can uh, be uh, seen in uh, may be associated with some vasculopathy of the uh, retinal uh, vessels then skin and joint always look for hypermobility you can see a very lax skin you can uh, see the cigarette paper scars here you can see the blue sclera here and also the pudy uh, orange appearance which is seen in pseudoxanthoma elasticum so this may tell that there is underlying vasculopathy and these patients may develop strokes they may develop uh, aneurysms they may develop uh, bleeds in the brain morphonoid habitus always look for that you can see high as palate arachnodactyly the increased arm span then you can see the classical uh, this is the uh, this is the wrist sign and this is the thumb sign so this is also wrist sign is called as the walker madox sign and this is the thumb uh, sign or the steinberg sign so always look for that mitochondrial diseases may be associated with uh, young stroke so you look for the short stature hearing problems this is the midline lipoma this is the hearing aid 
ptosis they may be having and then retinitis pigmentosa so these are the rarest causes oral ulcers erythema nodosum genital ulcers then nail pit infarctions petechial lesions purpuric lesions so i have a detailed skin examination and uh, you can see the libido reticularis like lesions which is seen with uh, sle as well as there is something called as the sneedon syndrome which may be associated with strokes the mala rash and then certain conditions which can have telangiectasia so you can see multiple telangiectasia all around so this can also give rise to brain hemorrhages you can look for nevus this nevus may be associated with uh, uh, the brain uh, intracranial uh, lesions in the brain which can give rise to stroke drug abuse tattoo marks hiv look for the uh, the candidiasis this is the neurosyphilis palm involvement the syphilitic lesions here and this is very very important herpes so any herpetic lesions you should look for because they are more prone for developing uh, the corneal ulcers also cavernous sinus thrombosis and also they can uh, uh, get the vasculitis involving the brain so look for the general examination and then you go for specific examination look for pallor or plethora look for absent pulses which is seen in takayasus or irregular pulses uh, which is seen in uh, atrial fibrillation look for lymphadenopathy organomegaly look for murmurs in the heart and if the patient is febrile with murmurs in the heart and there is pallor then it's likely to be infective endocarditis look for carotid and subclavian bruising and also peripheral pulses if you get, don't get the pulse in one hand or there is a asymmetric of uh, the pulses in both the hands then definitely look for the bruising uh, you can look for the carotid bruising as well as the just below the clavicle you look for the bruising because usually in takayasus you will get a bruising all around so that may give you a clue you also look for the renal artery bruising if it's a takayasu disease and detailed neurological examination as per the protocol so this is how you uh, overall clinically evaluate the patient now you go for the investigations now you should know that the history the examination findings and the history and the background history everything will give you a clue and a provisional diagnosis and with that you are going to investigate the patient because the in resource uh, restricted countries like us investigating the young stroke may be difficult so every patient you cannot do the thrombophilia workup every patient you cannot do the vasculitic workup like ana and c ankas and all this because it has a huge economic burden and most of the patients will not be able to afford all the investigation so with your clinical sense with your examination and everything and the basic investigations you can plan out the further investigation and investigate according to the previous investigations which uh, the based on the reports of the previous investigations so doing the entire investigation together may not be necessary you do the basic preliminary investigation and based, uh, based on that you can plan for the further investigation for example hemoglobin and pcv you should do in all the patient eosinophil count can be done in all the patient peripheral smear you do esr crp you can do peripheral smear if there is some abnormality or if you suspect a sickle cell disease you will do the sickling test or hb electrophoresis renal function liver functions every patient you should do lipid profile should be done especially if the patient is obese sugar should be done in all the patients even in young stroke you do the sugars coagulation profile if you are getting a bleed you can do the coagulation profile lactate if you are suspecting a mitochondrial disease urine routine hematuria and cast you look if you are suspecting a vasculitis so if there are joint pain rashes you suspect lupus or some vasculitis you can you should do the urine routine and the cast serology hiv hbsag and hcv again wherever required you have to do and vdrl may also be done in patients if there is a history and if you are not getting the etiology of the stroke mantu test and chest x ray if there is fever and cough and all those things you have to do now cardiac examination is a must in all patients with young stroke so you do a ecg and a 2d echo and wherever indicated and if you feel there is some endocarditis or some valvular pathology with the uh, standard echo is not able to pick up you go for a trans esophageal echo and if a simple ecg is not giving you re uh, results you go for a halter monitoring and probably for a prolonged halter of 2 to 3 days and ideally 7 days uh, could be quite optimum and neck vessel doppler should again be done in most of the stroke patients cardiac enzymes wherever required now thrombophilia workup if you find that the cardiac workup is negative and the vasculitis uh, workup is uh, again negative and the you have checked the carotids and all the blood vessels which are again normal 
And if you think that the basic blood investigations are showing some abnormalities and you are suspecting a thrombophilia, then you go for the thrombophilia panel, which consists of protein C, protein S, factor V ladin, anti-thrombin 3, and the APLA antibodies and homocysteine also. So you do this. And vasculitis wherever required. ANA profile, C anka, P anka, and all those things. Pathology test for Bechet disease, you can do. Now, in young stroke, I'll suggest that all the patients, you should do the MRI scan. So just do not depend on the CT scan because MRI may be quite useful. It may give us some patterns which can help us in the diagnosis. For example, you look at Cadacil. There is a condition called as Cadacil, which is a cerebral autosomal dominant leukoencephalopathy with infarct. So this condition, there may be a specific pattern in which you may get an anterior. I'll, I, I'll show you cases of Cadacil, which I have. So I'll show you the imaging find, findings. So there are some patterns which may be helpful. Bechet disease, again, there is involvement of the uh, thalamo and midbrain junction. So that is a classical site of Bechet disease, which may be quite useful. Tuberculosis, we all know there will be a pattern. There will be basal exudates. There will be infarcts involving the deep penetrating branches and basal exudates and all the contrast enhancement may be seen. There may be granulomas. Okay, TB may, uh, CT scan may pick up the findings, but if the CT is is not picking up the findings and if you see abnormal CSF is there, then it's better to do an MRI scan of the brain. Mitochondrial disorders, the MR spectroscopy may be helpful in uh, showing us a lactate uh, peak and cavernoma will have a classical soap bubble, uh, a salt and pepper or soap bubble appearance, which may be quite uh, useful for the diagnosis. Now, contrast, you should insist on doing the contrast in infections and vasculitis because infections will show some contrast enhancement and vasculitis may also show blood vessel enhancement, etc. Gradient echo, which is for looking for the blood, may be quite useful, especially in embolic strokes where there may be bleed. CVT may be, uh, it may be a hemorrhagic infarct, so that may be useful. Vasculitis, there may be multiple microbleeds. Cadacil, there may be microbleeds. So you do the gradient also. Diffusion weighted, again, for the diagnosis of the infection, it may be useful. MR spectroscopy, I've already mentioned for mitochondrial. And you should do the T1 fat sat image, especially when you are suspecting a dissection to look for the intimal flap so that uh, fat sat images will help us to find out the flap. Now, angiogram, again in young stroke, after doing the MRI, basic MRI, if you see there are abnormalities and if you suspect any of these disorders like vasculitis, aneurysm, AV malformation, dissections, conditions like fibromuscular dysplasia, it's better to go for the MR angiogram. And MR venogram, if you are suspecting venous thrombosis. Now, DSA may be very useful. And uh, now it is seen that CT angiogram may be quite uh, useful and even better than the MR angiogram. But uh, as if you are not, if, if you are unable to give a contrast, then you can do the MR angiogram. There are tough images where contrast is not required, time of flight images. So that has the, and it's a non invasive procedure. So MR angiogram may have advantage there. but Usually, CT angiogram is very good and uh, it is also uh, cheaper than the MR angiogram. So, it may be a very good alternative for, for the MR angiogram. And DSA and CT angiogram, uh, it is seen that DSA has some more advantage compared to that of the CT angiogram. But as a screening tool, CT angiogram may be quite good. But DSA may be required when you are planning intervention. So, suppose if you are planning for a mechanical thrombectomy, you have to do the uh, DSA if you are having a Moya Moya disease and you want to do some intervention. Again, DSA is required. So DSA is the gold standard for the diagnosis. But CT uh, angiogram may be quite an effective uh, tool for screening uh, of the young strokes. Now, there is something called as an arterial wall imaging. So now this is coming up in a big way. Uh, but it usually requires a high resolu uh, resolution scanner, almost a uh, three Tesla or a very uh, well uh, uh, planned with good softwares. If you have a good M1.5, also you can do it, but usually 3 Tesla will be better. And it can tell you whether there is an atherosclerotic occlusion of the blood vessel or there is some vasculitis or some other pathology. But it has to be uh, done under expert hands and experienced people. Then only you can have a proper diagnosis. So arterial wall imaging is again a new thing which is coming in. Now, CSF study usually not required unless you are suspecting some infections like HIV, tuberculosis, or syphilis, or you are suspecting vasculitis like primary CNS angitis. Now, primary CNS vasculitis is one condition in which the CSF may be abnormal. 
and malignancies like lymphomas and all those things there may be having atypical cells in the csf which can be uh, useful and subarachnoid hemorrhage occult bleeding sometimes can be missed in the ct scan which a uh, csf study may pick up so these are the indications of csf study other indications like uh, biopsy and all not required unless you are suspecting uh, vasculitis and genetic test again only required if you are uh, having a uh, proper diagnosis in mind and if, uh, if the genetic condition is coming in the differential diagnosis list then you can go for the genetic test especially for mitochondrial disorders and cadasil where this specific gene is the notch 3 gene which can be helpful in the diagnosis so i think i have uh, covered main things now i'll just quickly go through few slides so uh, congenital cardiac disorders the risk factor of cardioembolic stroke in the perioperative period or following ecmo so this we are speaking about the uh, uh, congenital heart diseases which can give rise to stroke so these are the mechanisms that is paradoxical embolism hyperviscosity we have all seen congenital heart disease there will be polycythemia then there is increased risk of uh, infective endocarditis and septic embolism and there is a propensity to thrombosis and arrhythmias all this can give rise to strokes for example in this patient you can see there is a cortical infarct here and you can see there is a pfo here so this is the pfo giving rise to the stroke so diagnosis of pfo patent foramen ovale you should do a trans thoracic or trans esophageal echo with an intravenous injection of agitated saline so along with the echo you have to do give an intravenous injection of agitated saline and then you evaluate the patient at rest valsalva and cuff and if there are positive bubbles three or more appearing in the left heart within three cardiac cycles of bubbles filling the right atrium that means that there is a communication between the right atrium and the left atrium so that is diagnostic of pfo and you can also do a transcranial doppler which shows the bubbles in the middle cerebral artery so these are the ways in which you can confirm a pfo now what is the importance of pfo pfo uh, these are more commonly associated with strokes and the association is five fold more in the younger and two fold in the older age group and prevalence is 25% now the risk of uh, embolism is more with the pfo size the magnitude of the shunt the tunnel length and the concomitant uh, atrial septal aneurysm so if it's a large pfo and the tunnel length is very long and there is a atrial septum aneurysm then there is a high risk of stroke so these all characteristics we have to find out and then uh, decide whether we are going to close the pfo or we are going to operate on the pfo so this is a score which is called as the rope score which is helping us to find out what is the risk of the embolic stroke due to pfo itself so you score this patient whether there is hypertension diabetes prior history of tia smoker or non smoker what is uh, whether there is a cortical infarct in imaging so you score this and then you find a score so if the maximum score is 10 and minimum score is is around 0 uh, so more the score the more the chances that the uh, st uh, stroke is due to the paradoxical embolism due to the pfo so this score can be used in practice and this is the management protocol of pfo so if you get a pfo then you look at the age of the patient if more than 60 years you go for a antiplatelet therapy if it is 18 to 60 years then you look at the pfo whether the there is aneurysm what is the septal uh, uh, tunnel length and all those things and then if there are poor prognostic factors then you close the pfo and give antiplatelet along with that and if not then you continue antiplatelet treatment only now this is a common scenario patient present with, with fever and undetected um, uncontrolled fevers we don't know what is the cause of the fever pfo there may be joint pains there may be skin lesions like this and you get you see the vegetation here and there may be large stroke so this is called as a infective endocarditis now endocarditis is very important to diagnose because in endocarditis you should not thrombolize the patient because the chances of a hemorrhage is quite high so this is one condition where you avoid thrombolysis and you treat with antibiotics then this is a atrial myxoma you can see a large lesion here atrial myxoma giving rise to the stroke and you can see there is a dense mca sign also here so mca dot sign rather than mca dot sign which is the thrombus here which has migrated from the heart now you coming to the vasculitis vasculitis it's a large group and we know there are infectious vasculitis 
and then classical vasculitis secondary vasculitis due to collagen vascular disease etc will not go into the details so tuberculous meningitis is a very important cause of vasculitis you can see here so this is the brain stem this is the mid brain butterfly shaped structure and then you see there are multiple exudates bilaterally so these are all contrast enhancement and exudates you can see granulomas around and you can see there is due to the exudates what happens is the blood vessels becomes inflamed there is vasculitis of the blood vessel and there is occlusion of the blood vessel giving rise to strokes extensive strokes so actually we have to prevent this complication so how will you prevent this complication is by early diagnosis so whenever a patient has a fever headache and a diplopia and all those things then immediately you should do the imaging and do the csf and diagnose tuberculous meningitis early on so that the patient does not go for this complication post herpetic vasculopathy you can see there is a facial deviation and then later on there is a stroke large stroke involving there is a diffusion restriction here and you can see there is the right mcs cut off so this is a post herpetic vasculopathy there are two types of post herpetic vasculopathy one is a large vessel and a small vessel involvement now if it's a large vessel involvement the mri will show uh, stenosis and if it's a small vessel involvement the mri may be normal this we have to remember so this is one patient which i had years back so you can see there is a rash on the face and the patient developed altered sensorium you can see multiple hemorrhagic lesions so this was a vasculopathy and the angiogram was normal in this patient so you can see the angiogram is normal so it's a non uh, it's a small vessel vasculopathy which is occurring in the multiple territories due to herpes then syphilis again can give rise to stroke but very rare nowadays so you can see multiple infarcts vasculopathy and skin lesion so always if when you get a large vessel in fact and if you are not uh, sure about the cause of the stroke always do the csf vdrl because that will give you a clue regarding whether it's a secondary syphilis or not uh, secondary or a, a neurosyphilis with a stroke so usually it occurs later on usually in the tertiary stage will get the stroke now vasculitis we all know large vessel medium vessel and uh, uh, small vessel and the large vessel is takayasus and giant cell arteritis so both of them can give rise to stroke takayasus occurs in the younger age group less than 40 giant cell arteritis occurs after 50 years so elderly patient coming with headache coming with stroke like symptoms with uh, jaw claudication pain in the hands and the limbs in the proximal girdles polymyalgia rheumatica has fever has pallor is feeling very tired there is weight loss then you suspect a condition like temporal arteritis or giant cell arteritis and you may get a tender uh, swollen blood vessel or a non pulsatile temporal artery so which uh, may be a clue for temporal arteritis so it's a, again a, a very serious disorder and there may be visual loss so you have to diagnose the patient as early as possible takayasu usually in, occurs in younger uh, uh, females and usually they present with limb claudication and when you examine the pulses may be absent and there will may be asymmetrical blood pressure so these two conditions can give rise to stroke and uh, medium vessel kawasaki and pan may also give rise to stroke and uh, small vessel usually the stroke like presentation are quite rare in this condition so you can look at this takayasu disease you can see there is involvement of the blood vessel so you can see there is the right subclavian artery onwards there is uh, occlusion and also involving the renal arteries hpsc hpsag patient with multiple stroke like vascular lesions there are large punched out lesions in the legs and there is a digital gangrene dry gangrene and there are micro aneurysms involving the abdominal circulation mesenteric circulation so this is classical of polyarteritis nodosa so it's a difficult diagnosis to make because it is anca negative so neither p anca or c anca is positive so there is no serological marker for this condition and you have to see the clinical features and then maybe a mesenteric angiogram showing aneurysms and a biopsy will give us a clue that it is likely to be polyarteritis nodosa and basher disease i have already mentioned it's in the midbrain lesion oral ulcers and this is the classical pathology test in which you prick with a needle and then look for a vesicle formation at around 48 hours now this condition you should remember because this is one condition which can give which can give rise to ischemic and venous infarcts also arterial and venous infarcts both may occur in this condition the other condition which can give rise to arterial and venous infarct is apla syndrome so these two conditions you should remember now this is a very difficult diagnosis to make it's called as primary cns vasculitis so usually occurs in the middle age uh, people who come with 
a refractory headache they can present with stroke like episodes they can present with dementia cognitive decline memory impairment and all and there may be multifocal white matter lesions when you do the mri there may be multifocal white matter lesion with uh, there may be micro bleeds in the mri which will tell you that it's likely to be a vasculitis angiogram may show there is evidence of vasculitis so such patients and there is no evidence of any uh, systemic vasculitis so the esr is normal the crp is normal there is no joint pain no peripheral vasculitis only vasculitis which is confined inside the brain vasculature so that is called as a primary cns angiitis so in this patient you have to do the dsa to look for the bleeding which is seen here you can see multiple bleeding here and also you can uh, do the biopsy so there you have to do the leptomeningeal biopsy for diagnosis of this condition this is a life threatening condition and you have to treat the patient immediately with induction therapy cyclophosphamide and pulse methylprednisolone and maintain the patient on long term immunosuppression to save the life of the patient now there is an uh, there is a condition called as rcvs reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome it is seen in the uh, pregnant uh, uh, patients mainly and uh, it can be seen in non pregnant patients also it's also called as call fleming syndrome so okay so the classical syndrome uh, symptom of this condition is thunderclap headache and the thunderclap headache is multiple in nature so there will be recurrent thunderclap headache which occurs it is usually induced by some condition like pregnancy or taking a hot water bath or some heavy weight lifting etc any condition or drugs medications can trigger this condition and the patient will have a recurrent thunderclap headache and uh, there may be some uh, this is called as a subarachnoid hemorrhage so this is a convexal subarachnoid hemorrhage so if you get an convexal subarachnoid hemorrhage with a th thunderclap headache then it is likely to be rcvs while in a uh, aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage it is usually not convexional it is uh, it occurs in the lower part and usually you will have a one attack of thunderclap headache rather than recurrent attack of thunderclap headache and when you do the angiogram you can see here there are multiple occlusions here all around there are occlusions but after 12 weeks when you review or uh, repeat the angiogram you can see the blood vessels have opened up so in this stage it will look like a vasculitis but when you repeat the angiogram after 12 weeks it is reversible so that's why it's called as a reversible vasoconstriction syndrome and it is a differential diagnosis of cns vasculitis now this is susac syndrome which is uh, you will get a retino cerebro cochlear syndrome where you will be having uh, retinal branch retinal artery involvement and also multiple stroke like episodes with hearing loss in a young patient so that is called as a susac syndrome now apla syndrome already i have mentioned multiple arterial venous infarcts and you should always know that in apla syndrome there may be it may mimic an infective endocarditis so there may be uh, uh, some uh, uh, lesions vegetations in the valve and that may give rise to it's a cause of non bacterial uh, endocarditis and it may give rise to venous infarcts also so this is the deep vein which is involved and you can see there is bilateral edema involving the thalamus so this is a important cause of bilateral thalamic edema it may the differential diagnosis may be a adam acute disseminated encephalomyelitis so in a young uh, female with oral contraceptive pill suddenly becoming unconscious with headache papilledema and all you look for a deep venous thrombosis so and it can also occur in apla syndrome which has to be kept into mind now this is arterial dissection so history of trauma or without trauma presenting with neck pain and there is a ptosis and neck pain and headache always think of a dissection so you can see this is the t1 fat sat image which i have already mentioned you can see this is the internal carotid artery here which is normal you can see the lumen well seen but you can see there is a thrombus inside the lumen with the there is a margin here so this is called as the flap of the uh, the uh, the dissected artery so this can be found out with the t1 fat sat image and also you do the angiogram which will show you the dissected part so this is called a cervical artery dissection so this can be spontaneous also so we should know that dissections can be spontaneous and sometimes there may be an underlying connective tissue disease like ehlers danlos marfan etc which may go for a dissection of the blood vessels so this is the internal carotid artery dissection you can see there is the subintimal flap and later on initially there is a dissection there will be initially neck pain and some headache and some ptosis and all may be there and later on there is thrombosis involving the dissected artery and then the patient develops a stroke so usually the stroke will be bit delayed in a dissection 
and there may be aneurysm formation also sometimes pseudo aneurysm formation now vertebral artery can also be dissected so you can see there is a this is the vertebral artery in the right side and left side you can see there is a uh, non visualization of the vertical artery and you can see a stroke which has developed here so any lateral medullary syndrome and brain stem stroke if there is neck pain and history of some manipulation or trauma always suspect a vertebral artery dissection and now the treatment is usually by anticoagulation with heparin and continued and followed by warfarin for 6 months now you should know that surgical repair is required if there is pseudo aneurysm etc or if it is not responding to medical management but if there is a intracranial dissection along with extracranial dissection you should avoid anticoagulation because the subarachnoid hemorrhage can occur so only extracranial dissection you will give anticoagulation for 6 months now this is a fibromuscular dysplasia very rare condition uh, I, I, i don't think i have seen any patient but young a child with renal failure and uh, accelerated hypertension and stroke you should think of this rare condition and you get the classical string of bead appearance in the fibromuscular dysplasia you can see here now history of radiation and then patient develops stroke later on you can see there is occlusion of the blood vessels of the circle of bilis and there are multiple collateral formation so this is the puff of smoke appearance and then they usually present with bleeds and initially they will have infarction because initially there is occlusion of the blood vessel so the blood supply is reduced and they develop infarction and one more important sim symptom of moya moya is uh, crying or hyperventilation induced tia so whenever they cry or they hyperventilate or they breathe very fast they develop tia like symptoms so that may be initial clue and they may develop ischemic strokes initially and later on when the collaterals become huge and they they are quite weak collaterals and the walls are very thin they may go for intracerebral hemorrhage so these are the various causes of moya moya multiple causes are there and moya moya disease is the classical one while this is the moya moya syndrome which has a multiple classes so there are uh, various uh, gradings of the moyama disease it's called as suzuki's arteriographic gradings i'll not go into the detail and you should know that the ischemic moyama you treat with platelet uh, anticoagulants uh, you uh, antiplatelets you use and then also vasodilators and calcium channel blockers may be tried steroids no role and surgical revascularization has to be done now coming to focal cerebral arteriopathy which is a common condition uh, which is emerging in the childhood and usually they'll have known atherosclerosis unilateral focal arterial stenosis so this patient i have already presented first case so there are two types one is a dissection type and second is an inflammation type i'll just rush through this now there is one uh, um, interesting condition which is called as ada2 deficiency or it's called as dad2 dada2 deficiency so this is a condition which present with childhood stroke and you usually mimics a polyarteritis nodosa like picture and uh, this is one general case which i could find out there are multiple skin lesions and this patient usually present with infarction as well as bleed so both type of strokes may occur in this condition and these are the various manifestations of the deficiency of adenosine 2 deaminis uh, this so they will be having immunodeficiency so they are more prone for infections bacterial infections and all those things bone marrow problems cytopenias may occur and there may be having multiple manifestations so whenever you have such systemic symptoms along with stroke and all those things always suspect this condition called as dada2 and usually they will be having hepatosplenomegaly recurrent fever weight loss and also it may look like some infections and also this condition has to be suspected in the Uh, it's a rare condition but uh, it is quite seen and uh, in chandigarh in india there are a lot of case reports of this emerging condition and there are other rare conditions also like caracel caracil fibromuscular dysplasia as which i have also mentioned there is something called as face syndrome in which you may be having posterior fossa malformation which can give rise to stroke there is something called as a bow hunter syndrome or rotational vertebral artery syndrome in which there is symptoms of brain stem or cerebellar ischemia around the vis three segment on physiological rotation of the head so when the patient rotates the head to one side and extends there may be a tia like symptom so such things you think of a dynamic compression of the vertebral artery now drug induced stroke i have already mentioned infarcts and uh, bleeds both can occur and this is the condition which is called as cadacil so you can see there is a 
classical involvement of the anterior temporal lobe and the external capsule. And these are the classical curvilinear bodies which you skin, see in the skin biopsy. And this is a notch 3 gene which is uh, responsible for the cadacil. Now, I have two patients which are under follow-up, mother and son. Both of them having cadacil. You can see the multiple extensive impact. So, this is a young boy, a young man, almost 35 to 40 years. And the mother is around 60, 70 years. And she is having full-blown lesions, multiple lesions. And you can see the temporal lobe involvement. And the son just had a TIA. But the MRI is showing there are multiple lesions. So, he is probably going to develop the full blown picture and this uh, lady, the mother has dementia, memory loss. She's having features of va vascular Parkinsonism, gait abnormality and all those things. While the son is asymptomatic with just one episode of TIA, but you can see the MRI picked up multiple lesions, suggesting that both of them are having cadacil. And mother has been tested for the notch 3 gene, which is positive. Son, since the MRI is corroborating, we did not go for the genetic study. So now this is melas. Melas again, you will have multiple uh, lesions. Now you see there are large lesions which are uh, not confined to the vascular territory. So if you get lesions which are not confined to the vascular territory, you think of conditions like melas or you think of a venous infarct, which again do not go for the vascular uh, territory. And you can see the, there is a lactate peak here. And sometimes basal ganglia calcification may be seen in the CT scan in melas. So this again shows the melas like syndrome. Now, Fabry's disease, you get the skin lesions. It's called as angiokeratomas in the chest. And you get the corneal abnormalities and you get multiple stroke-like lesions and also renal involvement. So there is renal failure also. If you get multiple system involvement and small fiber neuropathy. So these are the classical manifestations of Fabry disease. Very rare condition, but it's a treatable disorder because there's an enzyme replacement which is available now. Now, going to migraine, this is the classical aura of migraine. You can see there is a spot here with a colored thing here. So, migraine can give rise to strokes as well. Usually, the strokes are in the posterior circulation and three times higher risk of stroke is there in the migraineurs and also uh, carotid artery dissection and PFO may be associated with migraine. So, this can again increase the risk of stroke. So, these are the various mechanisms and especially the migraine with aura and the subtypes of migraine like hemiplegic migraine, baseline migraine and retinal and ophthalm ophthalmoplegic migraine can give rise to stroke. So when do you suspect a migraine related stroke? Young female, high risk migraine subtype, especially smoker with migraine. Be very careful. Migraine patient on oral contraceptive pills, high risk of stroke. And onset is usually typical followed by a, a severe migraine headache and there may be prolonged aura. Uh, before the onset of the um, uh, stroke-like symptoms. And posterior circulation is usually involved. So you should uh, just I'll highlight this point. If there is smoking along with migraine, there is a tenfold increased risk of stroke. And combined with oral contraceptive uh, OC pill with migraine, 17 fold. And if the patient is a migrainer with smoking and OCP, almost 30 fold higher risk of stroke. So all migrainer patients with aura, Tell them to avoid oral contraceptive pills and not to smoke. Yeah, even uh, females do smoke, so you should ask them strictly not to smoke because that will increase the risk of stroke. So this is one patient with migraine which I had. So you can see there is a small stroke involving the right uh, upper part of the thalamus or the lower corona radiata, you can say. And then there are no risk factors. Workup is entirely normal, so probably it is related to the migraine. Hematological conditions, sickle cell can give rise to stroke, I've already mentioned. And polycythemia rubra vera. So this is one condition which can give rise to stroke. And you can see there is redness of the hands and feet, which is called as erythromelalgia. So two systemic symptoms of polycythemia, we all know there is hyperviscosity symptom. There may be tinnitus, there may be headache, there may be plethoric eyes, there may be erythromelalgia, that means burning sensation and pain in the extremities. And a classical symptom is aquagenic pruritus. So whenever they take a hot water bath, they get the classical pruritus. And hyperuricemia, peptic ulcers, joint pains, and all those things may also coexist. So whenever you get this symptom complex, uh, then you think of an uh, polycythemia. And ask history of smoking also because that may be the commonest cause. So I've, I had a case before, uh, polycythemia rubra vera, which presented with a stroke. And when we ev evaluated, the hemoglobin was very high, around 17 0.5 and then we did the JAK2 mutation which was again 
detected. Jack two mutation was found to confirm polycythemia rubra vera. Treated with hydroxy hydroxyurea and also with phlebotomy and uh, drainage of the blood. And few patients with protein S deficiency which had stroke, multiple stroke. So protein S deficiency two patients with stroke. So these are the various causes of uh, acute stroke. Now the treatment I've already mentioned, you thrombolize the patient if more than 18 years non-pregnant and there are no contraindications. And premature atherosclerosis, antiplatelet statins and risk factor modification as in the elderly patients. Then infective causes, ATT with steroids, if it is tuberculous meningitis, with or without antiplatelet, whether aspirin should be given or not is not clear. Herpes, you have to give acyclovir with steroids initially. Syphilis, injection benzathiazepine, adioembolic stroke. You give anticoagulation, it's a valvular involvement or rheumatic heart disease. Warfarin should be given. If it's a non-valvular pathology, you go for Novax if the patient is having atrial fibrillation. PFO, if there is atrial septal aneurysm or a high flow, you do give a device closer. Otherwise, you go with aspirin. Infective endocarditis, you give antibiotic treatment. Now, for the venous strokes, APLA, protein C, protein S with venous stroke, lifelong anticoagulation is required. If there is recurrent CVT, again, you have to give indefinite anticoagulation. Otherwise, for pregnancy and purpurium where you are having a provoked CVT, six months of anticoagulation is enough. Unprovoked CVT, you give, go for one year of anticoagulation. Sickle cell, acute infarct, you go for exchange transfusion and hydration of the patient. And you prevent the infarct by keeping a HBS less than 30%, repeated transfusions, and you can use the transcranial Doppler, which can help you uh, regarding uh, the uh, management. And also hydroxyurea may be useful for sickle cell. Polycythemia, phlebotomy, hemodilution, and chemotherapy, hydroxyurea, and other medications with the help of the hematologist may be started. Vasculitis, I've already mentioned, high-dose steroids, cyclophosphamide may be used, and dissections, Anticoagulation, if it's extracranial, intracranial, you, usually you avoid anticoagulation. And pseudoaneurysm and other things, you go for angioplasty and uh, stenting. Operative procedures may be required. Now, moya moya, there is something called as a encephalo-duro-arteriosynangiosis or encephalo-myo-arteriosynangiosis, where you connect the temporal artery with the MCA and then so that the circulation is improved. So this surgical revascularization techniques may be used. Inherited disorder, if it's a mitochondrial disorder, you go for the mitochondrial cocktail where you use coenzyme Q, thymine, carnitine, folic acid, L-arginine, all this can be used. And favorite disease, enzyme replacement, though very expensive, is now available. So final few slides. We know that uh, young stroke, uh, the prognosis is better, but it may not be benign. And it was seen in various studies that 8% of the patient died, 3% from another stroke, 3% had myocardial infarction, and 16% were dependent even after the stroke. So though they have a better prognosis, there may be a lot of disability mortality associated with that. And the outcome is better. I've already mentioned because of good collaterals as well as good neuroplasticity. And the undamaged areas can frequently assume the function of the damaged areas. And sometimes the patient may improve uh, totally after the stroke. So we should start the treatment and manage them as early as possible. Now, take-home messages, it has a huge economic impact and increasing with the change in the risk factor profile, should be investigated properly for the etiological diagnosis. Maybe an initial point pointer to a deadly underlying disease. Treatment depends upon the etiology. Prognosis is usually good and prevention is the key. So you have to prevent the uh, stroke by proper risk factor management, ask them to stop smoking, maintain a proper body weight, do regular exercises, avoid alcohol. And these all basic things may be quite useful, especially in the premature uh, atherosclerosis group of the young stroke. So that is all from my end.